productivity is really the output per kilojoule of energy at a f- core first principles basis. So if your unit of energy cost goes down by half, it doubles your productivity. You're listening to Macro Sunday, hosted by Macro Sunday Podcast. I'm Andreas Steno, the host of this show and the founder of Steno Research. And this week, we're going to talk about the risk asset party that Jay Powell invited for this week with a very, very dovish press conference. And um, I'm joined, as per usual, by my lieutenant, Emil Müller. Great to see you. Cheers. Thank you. Live from the Wolfslayer here. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and as of the uh, time of the recording here, <laughs> not yet the father of three, as far as I'm concerned. No. Right? Unless my, my, my girlfriend has kept it secret, I think you're right. Uh, <laughs> won't, won't completely rule it out, but uh, no. <laughs> Let's see whether you're with us next week <laughs> after that yeah, comment. Yeah. <laughs> in, um, in 15, 20 minutes time, we're joined by Raul Paul, um, the mm. founder of Real Vision, but also the founder of Global Macro Investor. Uh, and it's safe mm. to say that he's been uh, riding the bullish wave for at least uh, a couple of quarters. Uh, and he's of the view that with everything that's ongoing in interest rate space now, that we may be in for almost an early cycle dynamic in financial markets, which would kind of wrong foot everyone, if that's true, into next year. Uh, we'll get back to that in a second, Emil, because we need to sort of digest this week of central bank action. And... Um, to set the scene, I'd like to start with a small soundbite from the press conference of the European Central Bank. Uh, I mentioned initially that Jay Powell was a clear dove uh, <laughs> at the FOMC meeting, um, but <laughs> Madame Lagarde, less so. So here is yeah. Christine Lagarde talking about rate cuts. We did not, we did not discuss rate cuts at all. No discussion, no debate on this issue. And I think everybody in the room takes the view that between hike and cut, there's a whole plateau, whole beach of hold. You know, it's like, a, I don't know, solid, liquid, gas. You don't go from, li- from solid to gas without going through the liquid phase. So it was, it was just not discussed. <laughs> Those were the words from uh, the natural uh, gas expert, Christine Lagarde, apparently. Uh, um, it you, sounds there... like the, the old Roman rhetoric uh, Cicero, no? <laughs> the whole plateau in the transition. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> but any, uh, anyway, yeah, go on. Emil, <laughs> in, interestingly, um, she basically said firm no to rate cuts being hmm. discussed, while yeah. Jay Powell obviously opened the door to the discussion of rate cuts for next year. Um, a couple of days later, on Friday, um, Williams of the New York FOMC, uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank uh, yeah. went on air on CNBC saying, no, we're not discussing it either. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what do you make yeah. of all these uh, back and forth discussions on rate cuts? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm pretty sure that if you had asked me before these meetings that who would who, who's who would be more likely to you know uh, release something that they shouldn't? It would probably be Lagarde, right? <laughs> um, and I, I'm still I'm still I'm still a bit shell shocked. Let me be clear uh, about what Powell did, um, but but I, I'm getting the feeling that it was planned and they they just uh, I, I I think I, I don't think they anticipated the reaction in markets to be honest with you, and that's why you have all these Fed chairs and whatnot out uh, doing damage control. Um, and rightly so, I think. Um, so that that's how I look at it right now. Um, I think, uh, ironically enough, uh, Lagarde and Powell should probably have swapped speeches, right? I think, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I think Powell's speech was probably was probably in order on when, when you look at at, at the European fundamentals. I think uh, the eurozone clearly needs that sort of of uh, revival. Um, but uh, alas, here we are. So uh, yeah, interesting times. So, so, Emil, uh, before joining Steno Research, um, among other things, you had an academic career, and yeah, more or less, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But I'd like your take, both from an academic and a practical standpoint, on the 
dot plot from the Federal Reserve as a um, mm. tool of communication, right? So mm. before I allow you the word, here's my five cents mm. on it. Um, yeah. I think the FOMC members thought that by hinting of three rate cuts next year, when markets already priced in more than four ahead of the meeting, mm. Mm. it would net net lead to a hawkish takeaway because they signaled yeah. less than the forward curve. Um, I think that's how far uh, they disconnect from financial markets. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure yeah. that they're really aware of how markets view these dots when they're presented each quarter. So is yeah. it even a good tool of communication given how bad they are at using it? No. I mean, I mean, if... if 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 you keep abusing the, the few c- clear line communication tools you have and they don't give you the outcome that you desired, no, then you know obviously there should be off limits. Um, and I think you're right. I think it's I think it's but also it's a wee bit interesting. I mean, uh, my feeling from the past six eight weeks is that you know uh, g- give the markets a reason to rally and they will do it. Um, and I think you sort of need that. Gut feeling is probably the wrong word, but you need to have that impulse when you conduct monetary policy. And it, it looks clear to me that uh, <laughs> that perhaps the the, the Federal Reserve is uh, uh, full of distant academics rather than hands-on market people, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, Clav- um, Clavida is not there anymore. <laughs> he, no, he had some, no. at least some decent uh, gut feelings uh, around how markets would perceive various co- uh, communication tools, um, but he's not there yeah. anymore. No. And I think I think the the other the other thing here is um, suppose you see some uh, surprises to the upside in economic activity or in price pressures. What do the Fed do from here? What what's what's your view? Because I think I think they put themselves in a really bad spot. And, well, it's and for no reason. It's it's tricky to make a U turn again, isn't it? Yeah. So. Uh, and essentially, it rhymes very well with with the next topic I intended on discussing with you, Emil, because risk assets are partying. Um, rather, all assets are partying. Even oil is is slightly yeah. up on the week. Um, so stop the clock. The oil price is increasing now, <laughs> alongside everything else. Um, uh, that's the uh, first, <laughs> at least for the past couple of quarters. But Emil, yeah. for how long can we? party here um given that liquidity is improving in dollars um yeah. quite clearly liquidity is improving mm. in uh chinese one we can discuss whether that's a strong signal or not liquidity is mm. flatlining to slightly improving in sterling while you yeah. only have a bad liquidity outlook in euros so yeah net net risk asset markets are just partying here yeah yeah and uh, i think they will endure that party for the next couple of weeks unless we get some really like tail tail risk uh, data print or whatnot mm. um what's going on in the middle east could potentially uh, provide such an event um but i think right now what what's really interesting is you see really bad activity prints from france and germany and yet you know european equities are holding up rather well uh, and i think everything right now is about what's going on in the us um uh, simply due to due to um, the, the recent uh, pivot, if you like, from from Jerome Powell, I think that that leaves off the pressure on both fixed income and and risk assets alike. So I think that's that's really what to watch, and that's 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 what's going to lead markets in the coming weeks, unless we see something, uh, yeah, rather unpleasant unfold. Um, but I, but I think it's I think it's a bit odd because the eurozone is clearly in recession and European risk assets just you know couldn't be any bothered about it, <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit interesting. Um, so but yeah, for, with that in mind, I think uh, bonds are just looking increasingly more attractive relative to to stocks. Right, mm. that's that's my main takeaway. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and bonds have basically outperformed stocks if you look at it over the. Uh, past three weeks, roughly, yeah. uh, for the first time in quite a while. Um, yeah. So that's something. Um, and if we look at forward pricing now, um, roughly six cuts priced in for the Fed next year, less yeah. uh, than that in uh, in Europe, both when it comes to the European Central Bank and um, the Bank of England. And we haven't touched upon the Bank of England yet, but they basically no. <laughs> copy-pasted their <laughs> rhetoric from a couple of months ago exactly what I expected the Fed to do. <laughs> so the Bank of England <laughs> is still stuck in a rhetoric around inflation being too high. We need to ensure that yeah. it uh, basically t- yeah. has a trajectory towards target and all of that. Um, but 
let me remind you that we have the inflation report for November uh, ahead of us this Tuesday from the UK. It will be an outright stinker um, if our months are right. So in yeah. in that direction, south basically <laughs> yeah. for prices. Um, yeah. And I think maybe they, they didn't know the results. Um, essentially. No. Yeah, yeah. And I also think, I mean, the interesting part here is that, that Powell has essentially... In, in the way he has, he has chosen to conduct his rhetoric, you know, left uh, forward guidance to basically be in market prices, right? Mm. While uh, Lagarde is on her back foot, just, you know, we, we can't promise anything, we don't know anything, we are, you know, riding blind here. Um, but the Bank of England is a bit more, I think they're just nervous, and yet there seems to be some sort of, uh, I won't call it internal conflict, but there's clearly, clearly dissent within mm. the bank, right? And that that sort of leaves, uh, I think, uh, higher odds of of uh, of surprises in in, uh, in monetary policy conducting in, from England than the rest. But yeah. last year we are basically just copied what they did last time. But what you said about the European Central Bank it leads me to uh, <laughs> the idiot of the week. Um, I don't know whether <laughs> we've used that term before, but uh, the idiot of the idiot of the week this week is without yeah. a doubt. François de Villois from uh, Bank of mm. France. Uh, so yeah. the uh, European oh. Central Bank oh. member from France. I think yeah. 30 minutes before uh, the release of the French PMI in deep recession territory, he said yeah. the Eurozone, including France, will be spared of a recession in 2024. <laughs> Quite the time. Um, but at, 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 as someone wrote on my Twitter, at least he's not trying to front run things, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Oh, that's shocking. Yeah. Absolutely shocking. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's so out of whack with reality. Um, yeah. What's going on in Frankfurt right now, if you ask me. But uh, let's see for how long also, that can continue. E but even, even still, suppose he was right. Why would you make that comment before the prince? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, it was like an old, Chris, old Christmas interview. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> will, um, it's time for the soundbite uh, of the, the true president of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump. Uh, and, Finally. Yes. And uh, of course, Trump's got an opinion on the stock market um, this is from a press conference he called for himself during his reign um, to talk about Dow Jones breaching the 30k mark uh, and as usual it is highly entertaining when Mr. Trump talks about markets well thank you very much and I just want to congratulate everybody the stock market, Dow Jones Industrial Average, just hit 30,000, which is the highest in history. We've never broken 30,000, and that's just despite uh, everything that's taken place with the pandemic. I'm very uh, thrilled with what's happened on the vaccine front. That's been absolutely incredible. It's, uh, nothing like that has ever happened medically, and uh, I think people are acknowledging that and it's having a big effect. But uh, the stock market's just broken 30,000. Never been broken, that number. That's a sacred number, 30,000. Nobody thought they'd ever see it. Uh, that's the ninth time since uh, the beginning of 2020. And it's the 48th time that we've broken records in during the Trump administration. And I just want to congratulate all the people within the administration that work so hard. And most importantly, I want to congratulate the people of our country because there are no people like you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he called for this press conference, 60 seconds yeah. of, uh, of uh, a victory, a victory lap here. But um, did you, did you have a question that he was a humble man? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I actually miss these kind of press conferences. Uh, I mean, why don't we have Biden on stage now that equities are partying again, right? Um, <laughs> But it, it leads me yeah. to a, a very interesting discussion because given how surprising this pivot from Jay Powell was in many ways, mm -hmm. and given how dovish the intentions are within the Federal Reserve ahead of that election date uh, come November next year, mm. is this a political message? Well, there's no, there's no question that the Treasury and the Federal Reserve are in cahoots together. Uh, they simply have to, to some extent. The question is whether the Federal Reserve is essentially just following the bidding of the U.S. Treasury. On that, on that score, I'm a bit more skeptical. 
Um, but that being said, I think, uh, I mean, you have a clear incentive from the political establishment in office to um, to lower the inflation pressures and keep the economy going, right? Mm. And if you can kick the can down the road, you will obviously use all the tools in the toolkit to, to accomplish that. Um, but I don't think the, the Federal Reserve is really... Um, is really engaged in, in any of that. At least if, if they were, they would have they would have uh, they would have uh, done a few things earlier. I would argue, and I, I would probably also say they probably should have. I, I'm I'm still skeptical about uh, you know September hikes and all that stuff. So I think they should just have hold the line and uh, and and let the monetary policy uh, uh, tool do its work. Instead, they just jump uh, on whatever the markets want at, at each and every turn. Um, so now. Um, but it's going to be interesting because uh, there's going to be a whole lot of of, uh, of public issuance and uh, lasting pressures on 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 uh, on the treasury's coffers. That's for sure. Hmm. So yeah, interesting days. Indeed, Emil. And um, the big question now: uh, we've seen hmm. easing financial conditions, basically yeah. eight uh, weeks running here, and. Yeah. I guess there's some merit to the view that financial conditions actually lead the underlying economy. Um, mm. You can find various semi-spurious <laughs> correlations showing that financial conditions lead manufacturing, they lead inflation and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So maybe this recent resurgence of everything from Bitcoin to technology to the broader <laughs> stock market is a harbinger mm. of a strong 2024 from a growth perspective. And that would be a major surprise in case uh, it is yeah. actually a leading indicator. But our guest of the week, Raul Powell, um, is very convinced that the market dynamics now resemble early stage um, cycle dynamics rather than late cyclical dynamics. And that is a very contrarian view um, that we obviously want to exploit here uh, at the Macro Sunday podcast. And if you're watching the show now, do not be scared of Chewbacca suddenly showing up on the screens. I've shaved since we did the interview with Raul Pal earlier this week. It was actually recorded just ahead of the Federal Reserve meeting. So I guess if we called up Raul today instead of uh, earlier this week, he, he, he would probably bang the drum on this story even louder. Uh, but here's Raul Pal. And um, as per usual, we will introduce Raul Pal with a uh, piece of music, and um, this time it's a song around the bulls. He was the founder of Real Vision, former Goldman Sachs, among other things. Raul, it's such a pleasure to host you here. Thank you for visiting our little podcast. Great to be here. So for me, I'm going to be you know, representing GMI, which is my research service, yeah. as opposed to Real Vision, because we don't have a view, but I definitely have a view. <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> and let's uh, elaborate that view a little bit. Raul, you've been banging the drum on positive liquidity developments basically for a while. Uh, and while the consensus out there keeps repeating that due to QT, uh, balance sheet drawdowns for big central banks, we should expect liquidity to dwindle. What's up and down on this story? Uh, I mean, is liquidity actually improving out there? Yes, it is. Firstly, as you know, rate of change matters the most, not outright. And the rate of change of liquidity has been improving all year. And by most measures of liquidity, whether using um, Global M2 or you know other measures of, of liquidity, we've seen an ongoing improvement in it. The balance sheet use is kind of the real juice on top of that. And we have seen bits and pieces here and there of balance sheet use, but that's not been the big driver. The big driver has actually been the net liquidity measures in most countries. And Fed net liquidity, I know you've talked about this as well, <clears throat> is really when you take into account the three main pillars of liquidity in the United States, because the US is the main liquidity driver. We'll talk about other regions later. Um, you know, yes, the Fed are doing QT, but that's been, and in addition, the Treasury were increasing the Treasury general account. And for a while, that was breaking the bond market. The last leg of the bond market was the bond market going, no, 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 we can't uh, deal with this new issuance because uh, liquidity conditions are too tight. And then the reverse repo started draining, and the reverse repo has dropped a gigantic amount and will probably drain to somewhere near zero. And that has offset all the liquidity. In fact, liquidity is up on the year. The Fed net liquidity is up 12% this year. That has a multiplier effect due to 
debasement effects and just general liquidity. And so, you know, that twenty that um, twelve percent led to twenty percent in the S and P, forty eight percent in the Nasdaq, and call it one hundred and fifty percent in crypto. Mm. If we look at the liquidity outlook for 2024, basically no matter who I speak to right now, the consensus remains very firmly in the camp of continued liquidity tightness into the first and second quarter next year. What do you make of the outlook for liquidity? Is it a feasible scenario that liquidity will actually keep increasing? Yeah, I'm going to share a couple of charts if that's all right. Mm. Yeah, sure. Um So these are some of the charts from Global Macro Investor. So financial conditions lead um, global liquidity by five months. And financial conditions have been, they, they corrected somewhat as stocks corrected, or certainly NASDAQ and stuff corrected. But really, it's, it's now going up as the dollars come down, uh, commodities have come down, and um, rates have come down somewhat. So global liquidity five months out, should continue to increase. Um, and that you can also see that when you look at it versus ISM. Uh, let's have a look, see if I can find the chart for you. Uh, can't find the chart. Yeah, here we go. So this one is um, weekly liquidity versus ISM forward-looking, i.e. 15 months inverted. The reason that occurs is because we're in this perfectly cyclical pattern that I came, that I talked about last time I was on the show about the everything code, which is where global rates reset in 2008 at zero, and all governments refinance all of their debts between three and five years. So you're getting this perfect four-year cycle that repeats. That perfect four-year cycle suggests that global liquidity just keeps going into 2024 and into 2025. And so we've just used that as the main guide. Now, it won't be perfect, but it feels that way because election years, what usually happens in election years? Well, stimulus. Then we look at global liquidity and say, well, what's happening in China? Well, they've got a deflationary bust going on right now, and the outcome will be more cowbell, be more liquidity. The Europeans are looking like that they're going to be the first to cut rates. So there's liquidity. So everywhere I look, and the UK will follow suit at some point as well. So in which case, the main liquidity drivers of the the Fed, the BOE, the ECB, PBOC, and the BOJ had been easing all year with yield curve control. We'll see what they do as well. So how does this rhyme with your view on the consensus ahead of 2024? Is the consensus still bearishly positioned? I think it is. Mm. I think people are confusing current economic conditions with the recession that they desperately want versus the markets discounting it, the forward-looking stuff like crypto and tech discounting it in 2022. They all have raging bear markets. Right now, we've got the Russell 2000, oil, copper, all of these things in present-day slow economic conditions. Do we get a full recession or not? It doesn't really matter. A, it was priced in, in the stuff that I care about. But the forward-looking stuff, all of the forward-looking indicators from ISM are all pointing firmly higher. So we're around the trough of the cycle. Doesn't mean inflation picks up from here. In fact, because inflation is so lagging because of owner-equivalent rents and wages that it should continue to deflate all of 2024, particularly at the core level. And the headline level, we think, continues to fall. So, you know, we're still of the camp that headline inflation probably gets to zero uh, next year and core inflation too, which I don't think anybody's prepared for because everybody's on the sticky inflation camp. Now, let's worry about inflation in the next business cycle when it heats up, not at the beginning of the business cycle. That's the macro summer, spring to summer transition is generally falling inflation, rising growth. And that's what we're seeing. Um, you know, all the forward-looking stuff is is clearly macro spring into macro summer. So where are we in the cycle? Uh, I mean, this is not a late cycle dynamic, is it? No, this is early cycle. Mm. It's exactly as it should be. So we've had the ISM troughing, all the forward-looking indicators pointing up. 
the business cycle dominoes mean that the things that the Fed look at, inflation and unemployment, are the last shoes to drop, which is why they've been very slow on this cycle. So what they will see is unemployment rising somewhat. Nobody expects a massive rise in unemployment, but a bit stickier. And I think AI and stuff like that will make it stickier. I don't think most of the jobs lost in Silicon Valley are coming back. So people have to reorganize themselves and to find different work and stuff like that. Um, and then inflation, I think, continues lower for you know at least next year. And then it'll start picking up again, as all business cycles do. And I don't know where the story that it's the 1970s all over again comes from, because I don't see it anywhere in the data. Of course, inflation will pick up next time. Of course, the year-on-year effects will make it look stronger. So we will get a rebound in inflation. But the reality is, is if you think that, that wage earners have the power versus a world of AI and robotics, I mean, that's a different world. This is not the 1970s of your parents. <laughs> no, no, it's certainly not. Uh, I was not even alive uh, back then, so I don't think I should spend too much time talking about it, Raul. But I, I'd like your take on how AI uh, plays into all of this. Um, if you look at the AI trends this year, they've obviously been remarkable, to say the least. Uh, and we have loads of discussions ongoing out there whether this will prove to be um, a long-term deflationary Im- impulse for the global economy. Do you see signs of that uh, already in the data that you follow? Yes, and every business I speak to is now starting to utilize AI. And that means that they will hire less. doesn't mean they lay off people necessarily, but they'll hire less in the business cycle, which is fine because unemployment's pretty low right now anyway. And we've seen that kind of behavior in Japan. Unemployment stays low regardless of the cycle because the labor force shrinks and the labor force shrinks in the US for the, for the same regions, demographics. But really how you need to frame AI is, okay, GDP growth, as I understand it, is really driven by, or trend rate of GDP is driven by population growth plus productivity growth plus debt growth. Now, debt growth stopped in 2008. All debt growth now is really servicing of old debts. It's the ongoing repayments of debt cycle. Productivity growth and population growth in all the developed world has been falling, which is why trend rate of GDP has been falling. So trend rate of GDP has gone from you know the early 90s of 3% down to, what, 1.75 now. So it's been falling because of demographics. But now you introduce workers or new productive units into the labor force, which is AI and robots, at infinite scale. Now, it's only just starting. People are still trying to figure out how to deal with this stuff. Most of us are trying to figure out how to ask it a question. It's like Confucius has come down from the mountain with all of his wisdom, and we're speaking in English, and he speaks Mandarin. And we're like, how the hell do I ask the right question? I know he's really smart, but I don't know how to do it, right? That's where we all are with this. But over time, the tools will get easier. We'll understand how to prompt it, and it'll become much more natural. And we'll integrate it into everything that we do. So if I look forwards, I only see an increase in AI and an increase in robots. We're seeing that in every factory around the world of the robots. And when robots have AI, they become even more productive. So this now mimics humans because you're infinite scaling of knowledge and applied knowledge. So therefore, it kind of solves the population problem. This is one of the reasons why China is talking so strongly about robotics as a core part of their future, particularly humanoid robots, is because they don't have the population growth. But this is a big answer. And when you do that, you start increasing productivity because productivity was dragged lower from demographics. The other part of productivity is the lowering of energy costs. Basically, electricity prices across the world have underperformed inflation. They've been relatively steady, except last year, obviously. So it's been steady. I I looked at um, UK inflation prices for the last 50 years, electricity prices for the last 50 years earlier this morning, and they've been flat for a long time. But as we introduce more renewables, as we introduce cheaper renewables you know there is a there's a 
exponential downwards in cost in this stuff. It's just you can't do enough of it and you can't store enough of it. But as technology improves, the overall cost of electricity will come down. And so therefore, productivity is really the output per kilojoule of energy at a core first principles basis. So if your unit of energy cost goes down by half, it doubles your productivity. And then you add the AI, the robots, and you know AR, VR, genetic sciences, all of these things on top, and you get a miracle, an economic miracle. Now, that's not going to happen this cycle, but we'll start to see the seeds of it. But really after the next cycle, by the time we get to 2030, it becomes almost impossible to predict what economies look like. There's a group at Oxford University where Nick Bostrom, who's one of the thought leaders on all of AI and where a lot of the work came from, there's an economist involved in that group that says, listen, if this continues to play out in the way that we think and the trend continues, there is no reason global GDP can't double in a year and even double in a week. <laughs> and I get it. You know, it's directionally right. Yeah. But it won't be now. But that's what's coming. This is what I think gets us out of the debt trap. This is the whole idea of this exponential age thesis that I've got, is this nexus of technologies all hitting adoption, exponential adoption phase at the same time, and kind of interwoven with each other, drive a productivity miracle, far and away larger than the one observed in the 1950s and 60s, which also got us out of the debt trap then, the post-war debt trap. Very similar situation. And it took us a while, a bit of yield curve control plus uh, new technology. This time around, we might get yield curve control, but the new technology is, is really going to change everything. So it's, it seems like a very, very interesting backdrop also macro-wise because let's assume that productivity skyrockets uh, alongside a GDP miracle. What happens to wages? What happens to interest rates in such a scenario, Al? Are they valuable? Do you need them? Should AI run the central bank? You know, it, it asks a lot of questions. What is the role of humans? You know, how do human societies organize themselves economically? What do we do to earn a living? Um, you know, things will change. We will adapt. It won't be the, the end of humans and we're all sitting at home smoking weed with nothing to do. There'll be something that replaces how humans, because humans are inherently social creatures. So I think we coalesce around digital online communities, which we're already doing, right? That's a mega trend. And can we earn within those communities? Can we play a fulfilling role within those communities? Like we used to do, you know, in the 1950s around the church and the pub and the, you know, and your community. We now live in different communities. We're less physically based in community and more digitally based in community. Is there an answer there where we can find purpose, meaning, and income? I think there is. Um, but it won't be from the grind of the nine to five. That, that those days will disappear in the next 10 to 15 years. Assuming that you're right that the liquidity cycle has already turned well, and um, assuming that you're right that liquidity will actually trend upwards uh, during the first couple of quarters of next year, if you look at markets today cross-asset, which markets are yet to sort of reflect this fact? So liquidity drives forward assets first, right? And the business cycle drives the rest of the assets. So if liquidity continues to improve and there will be some ups and downs and whatever, then technology and crypto will continue to outperform. But for people who don't like the racier end of the risk curve, 2024 gets very interesting finally for everybody in small caps, finally for everybody in emerging markets because the dollar should weaken as well, finally for everybody in commodities. You know, everyone had a false start in oil and then got absolutely slaughtered. Um, so we should see the traditional cyclical style economy pick up. But for me, they're the least interesting because what I've learned to do, if, if we are facing one gigantic, one delta risk on risk off world based around the global debt cycle, right, then diversification doesn't add any benefits. So what, What it dawned on me a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, is that actually, if this cycle is predictable, and I think this cycle will be, the next one, I don't know yet, but let's assume that this one's relatively predictable. 
Well, then you want to focus on the highest risk return you can get from the same unit of risk, the most return you can get from the same unit of risk. And on a risk-adjusted basis, again, technology and crypto outperform everything by a giant margin. And if I just look at a chart of NASDAQ versus anything else, kills it because they're both in secular trends. So in which case, armed with that information, I just can't get excited about owning commodities or emerging markets. What are emerging markets? They have a great year next year. Let's say they're up 50%. What's Bitcoin going to be up? 300? You know, and that's the issue I'm facing. And it's not because I'm a ridiculous optimist. It's actually because I'm so pessimistic that I realize that it's all driven by the same liquidity cycle now. And therefore, it's actually potentially the greatest gift we've ever been given as a macro trade. Looking at this question, intra crypto space, um, Bitcoin has sort of been leading the way over the past couple of months, to say the least. Um, how do you assume this liquidity cycle playing out within the crypto space? So, <clears throat> crypto is, you know, it's really interesting because people think it's some sort of weird internet funny money and it's not related to anything else. It's pure macro. It's pure macro. It aligns perfectly with the global liquidity cycle. Its risk curve is the same liquidity cycle as the bond risk curve, for example. So the first part of a recovery process, what you tend to see is treasury bonds rallying first, then you tend to go further out the risk curve. And then two years later, everyone's doing local market high risk private sector lending in the worst emerging markets in the world as they seek risk right it's the same in crypto so the first part of the bull market is always led by bitcoin we did get one breakout which was solana which killed it you know because it had its own adoption story but generally speaking what happens is once that global liquidity year on year goes positive and it's very close now that's when the risk curve ignites That's when Ethereum starts outperforming Bitcoin and we get what's known as alt season, which is the smaller tokens as people just go out the risk curve. That also corresponds with the Bitcoin ETF. So again, think of investor behavior. It's very typical for you and I because we've lived TradFi, but a lot of crypto people are new to understanding these things. So Bitcoin ETF, everyone's front running it. What happens the day it's announced? Well, usually there's probably a sell off, you know, buy the rumor, sell the fact. Fine. And then everybody, once the dust clears, is going to go, oh, the next one's the ETH one. Hmm. Now, ETH is half the size of Bitcoin, or maybe just less. So if you put the same hundred, you know, if you put the same billion dollars into Bitcoin and then move it into ETH, it's going to have an outsized effect. It's putting the same size elephant into a smaller bathtub. <laughs> and that's what happens. And then the money flows out of ETH and goes out of the risk curve into stuff less liquid and those things really rip. So it's actually just a pure macro cycle. It's nothing unusual. It's the same cycle that you and I have grown up with. Um, People just don't see it as such because the moves are so ridiculous. Uh, Because people don't see it through the volatility, which is why the log chart helps you understand it. Um, speaking of Bitcoin, Raoul, uh, if we look at the halving next year, is it a coincidence that the halving sort of coincides with this cycle? Or or how do you see that playing out? So, yes, because it all came from 2008. Hmm. Right? So it's the same cycle. The same cycle as the global debt cycle is exactly the Bitcoin halving cycle, which is actually also the election cycle. They're all the same thing. And the global rate cycle is obviously all part of the same thing. They're all exactly the same. This is why this is a gift. We don't have confusion. It's all the same fucking thing. You don't need to diversify because they're all the same thing. So you just choose the assets accordingly, according to your risk parameters. And um, I'll allow the audience to decide on the risk parameters themselves. That's right. uh, It's it's horses for courses, right? But on a risk-adjusted basis, These high-risk assets, um, um, you're more than compensated for the risk in a number of different ways, whether you anything from sharp ratios to 
max drawdown versus max gain through to anything. They all they all or just vol adjust. Uh, they all they it, they all outperform any standard investment. Mm. As per usual, Raul, I always ask my guests for the potential risk to the scenario that they put forward. And what would would be the main risk scenario to your liquidity analysis and to your liquidity cycle view for for next year? I think it's <clears throat> we assume that the central banks will use balance sheet to finance the interest payments. Mm. Maybe they don't. And therefore, maybe there's less debasement of currency. Therefore, the asset price rises are not as strong. Um, but we didn't use balance sheet in some of the other everything code cycles. And asset prices were still pretty strong. So I still think we see liquidity. We don't just know what sort of liquidity. The other thing is somehow they try and issue the debt without using the balance sheet. And you tighten monetary conditions all over again because the bond market can't take it. I, I just don't know how they can roll all of this debt at 5% interest rates. I mean, they've got to get it down to 2%, something like that, to be able to roll this stuff with some reasonable certitude, because if not, the market freaks out. But there is a chance of a freak out somewhere in the middle of this cycle where they think they can plow ahead and they can't because the market can't absorb it. Um, right. Yeah. If our audience wants to find out more about GMI, the liquidity cycle, and uh, your work on on the macro cycle role, where do they find out more? Um, so obviously, you can go to globalmacroinvestor.com. Um, there's a lot of it's on Real Vision as well, where I talk about it. There's a lot on the YouTube channel, Ralph Pell, The Journey Man. It's free. I talk about it a lot in that. And there's some presentations about the everything code and how all of this works. And I, I do think it's really foundational knowledge because it's it's something new. Um, and look, it's still a it's still a thesis, and it's still playing out. So we need to see how it plays out. But so far, it it really did well this whole year, and got us to. I mean, we kept most of it because we saw the liquidity bottoming last year. So we bought technology stocks at the bottom. We bought crypto at the bottom, or added to positions. And you know, those things are all up between fifty and six hundred percent this year. So we've had a ban a year by using this framework doesn't mean it's a guarantee that it works as you said that there are risks in this but i'm going to play it and see how it do, do, does play out i don't see any reason not to no and i i remember you and i having a discussion probably the second of january something like that this year where i asked you whether the um, sentiment was too bearish and uh, you said Without a doubt, and oh boy, you were right. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I kind of have the same vibes as I had in January this year, that a lot of people expect 2024 to be the bad year, and let's see. Well, look, it's also an yeah. election cycle year. Yeah, Election cycle years are always positive. Yeah. Because there's always going to be stimulus to bribe voters. So to go against that, to go against the forward-looking business cycle, is a very tough call. You would be doing it because emotionally you want that bear market or recession, not because the data leads you to believe it should be. I mean, it, it is what it is. Maybe we get a recession, maybe we don't. But either way, my, my view at the beginning of all of this, it was going to be more like 1990, which was mild, shallow, with some lagged effects on real estate and wages and unemployment. And I think that that still feels about right. Now, do we get negative GDP growth? I, I don't know. I, I still think we do. And it might be this quarter. Um, and it might be, you know, Q1. But I'm not sure. But it, it doesn't really matter. And I guess that's the, the perfect conclusion to this discussion <laughs> that look ahead instead of looking at um, the present when you invest. Raul Pal, it was a pleasure hosting you here at Macro Sunday. Thank you very much for being with us. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. This ain't a wild bull. It's just a bar stool. But it's all I can do. Back in the studio after a um, yep. great chat with Robo Pal. Uh, a very compelling storyteller. Um, and also a guy who's not scared of taking a contrarian view on things. Emil, oh, that's for sure. <laughs> indeed. And <laughs> I mean, 
I love that he dares to stick uh, his neck out, basically. But yeah. Emil, if if we look at the thesis that we're actually early cycle rather than late cycle, and mm -hmm. that the sell-off in 2022 was essentially the sell-off that priced in the recession that could arrive in mm -hmm. a very shallow way here short term. Yeah. Do you have any sympathy for that view? Mm. I think what what I find particularly compelling for that story to 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 earn its merits is basically if you look at at some of the uh, activity indicators, they're starting to turn. If you look at uh, S and P uh, new orders inventory in Europe, they're actually not as bad as you you might think. Uh, there's some signs of revival on that on that front, and then you have you know liquidity and financial conditions basically spilling over to the real economy uh, and that could indeed alter my my bearish view on on, on the world economy for the first half of 2024 um so I, i'm not i'm not completely uh, dismissive but I, i'm probably a somewhat less optimistic all <laughs> uh, everything considered um so um, as far as market pricing goes i still think that we would see uh, we would see lower earnings than and thus also no way could you price this, unfortunately. Yeah. Emil, yeah. Um, a few days ago, Timothy Fiore, I think his name is, uh, the chairman of the ISM Manufacturing Business Survey Committee, um, mm. went on Bloomberg. Uh, and after Powell's speech, he was <laughs> kind of shell-shocked, <laughs> as you put it. <laughs> uh, but he was also yeah. very optimistic about 2024. And he's obviously the guy uh, chairing the actual committee doing the survey in the manufacturing sector. And yeah. some of the um, indicators in the survey pointing six months out have turned, um, while the near-term picture is still very bleak. But there is a cause for optimism when I listen to a guy like uh, like that, uh, maybe in a couple of quarters mm. from now. So the interesting mm. thing here, if you ask me, is whether yeah. Powell is a genius or a madman, given that he's putting <laughs> interest rates into such optimism, um, or at least communicating that he intends on cutting interest rates into such an optimism. Because yeah. there is a... So I'd say early signs of green shoots when it comes to business surveys. Um, yeah. The sentiment is improving, liquidity is improving, and all of that. Uh, the cocktail yeah. is pretty bullish if you look at it um, uh, that way. So mm. when you start communicating that rate cuts are in play mm. over the next mm. six to 12 months, while co inflation mm. is at 4%, and we yeah. add signs of bullishness in these business surveys to the mix. Yeah. Is there a risk yeah. that you re-accelerate price pressures too early here? Absolutely. And I think that's that's sort of the problem because prices are still, uh, uh, inflation is still too high. <laughs> um, so so I think that that's the fundamental error that they've made here is they, they, they've removed all their own leeway that they had to navigate in what is most definitely an uncertain uh, trajectory uh, short term from here. Um, I mean, but if you have, say, um, a blockade down in the Suez Channel due to all what's going on around the, the coast of Yemen, and uh, you have, you know, increased uh, uh, pressures on the supply chains and all that stuff, and that starts to fuel in for markets and retailers and all that stuff, <laughs> you, you basically, you have, you know, you have... Uh, you put yourself in a, in, a, in a spot where you didn't need to put yourself, you know. Um, that's that's sort of how I look at it. Um, and I, and I will also add that uh, I think what's interesting about these, uh, well, we could call it earlier late cycle dynamics, is the complete dissimilarities that there are between different asset groups and different consumer segment classes and what have you, right? Um, so uh, with, with when you have financial conditions easing, uh, the question is what, what what is really going on? What what does it really encapsulate? Right? What mm. what, what does it capture? And where, where does that liquidity essentially go? Um, is it for the lower segments of the consumers? Is it for the service sector? It doesn't look that way right now, right? Um, but it seems to be the case that we have established a bottom in manufacturing, which sort of gives you this. Uh, <laughs> This odd dynamic where you have a, a service sector that's starting to lose its footing and manufacturing looking a bit more bullish than what you would 
usually uh, perceive in a in a disinflation and a, in a cooling economy, right? Mm. So it's it's a tricky it's a tricky point we're at right now, um, yeah. especially in Europe. Don't you think? In, indeed, um, yeah. I I think Emil, if we look at the historical evidence on the path ahead, when you start to signal rate cuts with inflation running a couple of percentage points above target in core terms, you only have one true uh, empirical period to to, um, to study. And that is yeah. the period of Arthur Burns being uh, yeah. chair of the Fed. Uh, mm. It obviously ended in tears for him um, with inflation <laughs> yeah. reaccelerating sharply. I, I'm not mm. sure that I, I truly buy that analogy, but um no. it's it's at least an experiment um to try and cut interest rates with core inflation running a couple of percentage points above target or one and a half yeah. um uh, depending on whether yeah. you look at the pc or or the, um, the cpi right but yeah. in any case um mm. we're talking about leaning into a um an experiment based on forward looking evidence um yeah. and that's essentially exactly what the Fed uh, um, <laughs> refrained from doing uh, during the way up. Uh, they yeah. kept saying we need to see inflation above target before we believe it. Uh, mm -hmm. That ended up being too late. So they're not. They're yeah. now trying to get ahead of the curve. Um, that's at least the positive storytelling around this, uh, yeah. which is always tricky uh, because there is a clear yeah. risk that you're wrong. Um, yeah. the, the risk in the other direction is obviously that you wait uh, for too long um, in mm. a disinflationary uh, environment. Uh, but yeah. I, I, I'm not sure right now. Which, and mm. essentially what I'm trying to say here is that I think the, the tails in the distribution are extremely fat for 2024. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's a clear risk that we will end up with inflation way too high by uh, mm. December next year. I also think there's a mm. risk that they've <laughs> basically uh, <laughs> too little too late to this, um, yeah. meaning that we will get inflation below target. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not really, I don't have, hold a high conviction here. I have to admit that. No. And no. therefore, from a trade construction perspective, I like trade ideas performing in both ends of the tail. Uh, so, yeah. so is it possible to construct ideas uh, that will provide a positive return if we get to the right-hand tail of the inflation uh, distribution and the left-hand tail? Mm. And I actually think it is, because if you look at the steep in the trade in the dollar curve, yeah. we've put that on again with pretty decent luck again. Um, yeah. We did that ahead of the meeting, by the way. Yeah, That trade will perform in both tails, I think, at least initially. Yes. Uh, if we get a recession, the Fed will have to cut more than what's priced already. Um, that will lead the front end down, leading to a bull steepening of the curve. That's essentially what we've seen lately. If we get a scenario with continued high issuance, um, a shallow recession, and sudden cyclical positive vibes out of manufacturing, you'll get a bear steepening of the very far end of the yield curve amidst the Fed not doing anything in the front. Um, yeah. i.e. still a steepening of the yield curve. So I really like yeah. that trade, both in the scenario where, where we get a positive cyclical surprise and in the scenario where something breaks yeah. and we get a recession. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, well, I mean, e e even from a, from a, uh, you know, a, a data standpoint, uh, uninverted yield curves are usually a temporary phenomenon, not, not a multi-year thing, mm. right? Um, so, so yeah, I think uh, on a risk reward basis, it's one of those trades that that should perform, and you should just give it time to to uh, to to do its work. Um, I also think that uh, our uh, our tips trade mm. could could really perform in this. I mean, you need like strong repricing of of the curve, which since we've entered, we've actually had right mm. or. Um, or you need uh, real rates to really to really do it, do the job right, and I think it 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 it, it performs in both environments. Um, so I think we we're, we're in a good spot on, on that on that score. Um, so yeah, even though we we we're surprised by what uh, Powell did, we actually made uh, a, a, a you know, decent chunk of money. Mm. <laughs> yeah. uh, so portfolio construction that's an important thing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what's everything Thank about you. is about. Uh, I was. Yeah. <laughs> extremely surprised by the pivot from Powell, mm. and yet we made yeah. a lot of money on it. Um, 
Yeah. That's what you want, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, let's see in the uh, weeks ahead, Emil, here, uh, whether the yield curve calms down a little bit. It's been like trading EM over the past week here, uh, especially the dollar mad. curve. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> other than that, Emil, it's, it's maybe worth... Um, discussing a couple of trade ideas uh, that we've yeah. also uh, entered through the week. Uh, we yeah. bought duration in Australian markets. Um, mm. And I mean, the very simple storyline there is that if you look at forward pricing of Bank of Canada, the Swedish Riks mm. Bank, other central banks with a very large housing yeah. component to the economy yeah. uh, with yeah. sticky inflation because of rents, um, mm. That's basically also the case for the U.S. Then forward pricing is um, very, 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 very dovish relative to the Australian forward pricing. Uh, yeah. So is there a case to be made here that the Australian Central Bank is the ultimate laggard here? Uh, they were the ultimate yeah. laggard on the way up. Uh, I think yeah. I think that's a pretty decent uh, risk reward trade if you look one, two quarters ahead that they have to turn around if everyone else <laughs> does. I agree. So, right? yeah. and and if you look at domestic indicators and, and uh, actual demand in Australia, it seems to be really compressed. So I would be surprised if we could, if they can really keep keep rates at where they are and, and not try to push some some cuts in. So I think it's it's a decent risk reward trade. I think the joke for that for that entire thing to play out is really what's going on in China. If they really pivot <laughs> on all the on the clampdown in the real estate sector, you can see the miners starting to take all the income back into into Aussie land and you have you have some issues uh, on the, from a duration side of things but uh, that's a tail end uh, yeah. right now it is don't seem engaged in it and in so. equity space I think the mm. really interesting trade here is to be long utilities um, yeah. I also tend to think that utilities work in both tails uh, of the distribution yeah. at least initially again here yeah um, if we are to see a revival of inflation, it is likely to include uh, rising prices and margins for electricity, for example. Uh, we've also mm. already seen early signs of that uh, through November and December here. Um, yeah. On top of that, utilities uh, are defensives and yeah. they are very sensitive to the yield curve as well. Uh, so a, a bull steepening is typically a pretty positive scenario for utilities relative to a lot of other asset classes in the equity space. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I like that trade as well. And it performed like crazy on Powell's press conference. It uh, gave back mm -hmm. a little bit of that over the uh, remaining part of the uh, yeah. week. But also yeah. here, a trade that can work uh, should you be mm -hmm. wrong-footed by the actual macro environment. Yes, and and also if you, if if we have some some noise in on the on this in, in energy supply and whatnot, they can usually pass on and, and take in the margin, right? So that adds you a, a foot of exposure to what we hope obviously won't occur in <laughs> in, in geopolitics and the Middle East, right? But uh, nonetheless, as far as equities goes, it's probably the, the safest bet on on uh, on on developments on that front. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's, it's a it's a decent uh, risk reward. I think it is. And uh, Emil, let's yeah. leave it at that for this week. Um, yeah. Now that we've discussed trade ideas, I think it is in due time to uh, to play our disclaimer of the show. The best <laughs> disclaimer in the world. Uh, so here is Gennaro Catuso with the disclaimer of the Macro Sunday podcast. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Obviously referring to our trade ideas and trading, by <laughs> the way. On. Yes. Um, yeah. Pretty good this week, uh, despite us being wrong on everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Be better that way on the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, it uh, it yeah. doesn't allow you to take a victory lap on Twitter, and uh, sometimes that's no. actually worth more to me. <laughs> to yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah. In any case, Emil, it was great seeing you again. And um, yeah, well, go have a look. <laughs> at whether you've become the father of three while we've recorded here. I, yeah. I hope not. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, thank you, everyone out there for listening and watching the um, Macro Sunday. Uh, we'll be back again next Sunday with the best macro independent takes in the world. My name is Andreas Dino. See you again next Sunday.